I'm Mary Ann Piet from the Building Technologies Department, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. We have Yves Van Berger. He's from Electricité de France, and he has a background in research. He started with the Ecole Polytechnique in the highway department, working on structural mechanics. And in 1980, he joined Electricité de France, which is the, the main utility uh, providing electricity in France. Uh, it's a pleasure to have him here today. He was also at the Electric Power Research Institute uh, yesterday, I believe it was, and is here in California uh, w looking at our national research agenda. And it's a, we'll, we're uh, enjoying him uh, being over in Building 90 today to meet with us about the future of electricity. Uh, he was involved in the Computing and Applied Mathematics Department uh, and he joined EDF in, in 1980, I think I said. So he's had a long career at EDF that also in view, involved the computing and telecommunications activities. He was the technical director for information systems. And in 2002, he was appointed the executive vice chair, the head of Electricité de France Research and Development Department. Uh, he's going to be speaking about electricity and using less CO2. We'll go ahead and uh, keep the questions till the end. We'll try to end about 10 minutes early uh, for the next 45 minutes or so. And uh, so please, let's hold the questions until the end, unless, unless it's a very brief clarifying question. And uh, let me uh, let you take it away. Thanks, Marianne. <clears throat> Bonjour à tous. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Be, to see again Art Rosenfeld and uh, to be here, even if to come here um, it was not very good for my footprint. Uh, I'm sorry for that. And I, I will try to explain you our view. It's a view from an industry, industrial uh, company from EDF. Uh, I will try to show you why we are convinced that in the future uh, we will have we will see an increasing role of electricity in the human society. Uh, so here you have the agenda. Uh, I will first explain my title a bit. Then I will go to the demand side, uh, then to the electrical system and the grid. And I will try to end with some, to present some needs, some needs for you. Uh, what we are waiting from Berkeley and from other places, research in different areas, and it will be my conclusion. Uh, just one slide on EDF. Uh, EDF is the providing electricity in France, but not only in France, in different countries. Uh, we have uh, 160,000 employees. We have now 40 million customers and we have the biggest nuclear fleet in the world, but we have also solar energy, wind energy, and coal, and so on and so on. It was, I was uh, for a long time the head of EDF R&D with 2,000 people working for nuclear, but also for energy efficiency, and the different area we will, we will speak in a few minutes. So, why more electricity for less CO2? First, why more electricity? Here you have the list, a uh, very short list of electric end users. Uh, every day we, we see progressively new users. Uh, I discovered one this morning in the building uh, 40 where I was for a meeting. I see that you have an electric soap dispenser when you are going to the restroom. I'm not sure that it's really useful and really logic uh, in the sustainable development uh, idea, but it's efficient. Uh, what we see for the last, I would say the last century, is an increasing role of electricity. Around 1900, it was less than 1% of the use of energy uh, for the main kite. Around 2000, in Europe, in US, in Japan, it was not far from 20% of the global use of energy. Here you have the curve for China. 
uh, for India, for Brazil. For Brazil, this decrease is interesting. Uh, it was not good for them, but they have much hydro, and that year they didn't have enough water, and so there, there was there a slight decrease. The forecast from uh, all the agency institutions everywhere in the world is uh, this increasing role I was mentioning. Here you have the four scenarios from the World Energy Council. And when you are looking on other scenarios from other agencies, you have approximately the same. It means around 2050, probably 40% of the energy used by the mankind will come through electricity. The other part will be biomass. Uh, some people are working on that here. And naturally, also direct use of coal and some other things. Uh, would you define final electric consumption? Is it measured at, uh, at the world club or is it primary energy? Level? Primary energy. Thank you, Art. Question. Uh, so all that is well known now. The question is how to have the right energy quantity for all human beings. We know that the situation it's very contrasted, they're different from one country or one continent to another. And we have these three, sorry, we have these three very important questions uh, that all countries, US like France and other countries are facing. And what we are thinking is that the electricity, it's a part of the solution, a big part of the solution, and will also help to decrease the generation of CO2. How it's possible? First of all, I will look on the demand side. On the demand side, uh, with three aspects at home, then on the road with the car, then in the industry. And after showing what's happening on the demand side, I will go to the grid and to the electrical system. And if you have on the demand side if you use much electricity, if this electricity is without or with low carbon, it means that you will help to decrease the CO2 emissions. Here you have in France, but it's not so far in other countries, the repartition of the use of energy. Uh, the final energy consumption is the final art. Uh, the highest part is coming from the buildings then you see agriculture is very low, uh, industry and transport. If you have the CO2 emissions, the percentage is very different because especially in France, we have, <coughs> sorry, you have, as you know, we have much hydro and nuclear. It means that the CO2 emissions for the buildings are relatively low, but it's still 28%. And when you are looking more precisely on this 28%, you have eating and hot water, which are very important, especially eating in our country. When you are in California, it's not so heating, perhaps today, but the other days is far more air conditioning. When, you are, when we are looking on the, on the buildings, which is the situation, which is the role of electricity? But first, the first question is, uh, is it possible to reduce the use of energy, to increase the energy efficiency, to reduce the energy needs? To do that, you know, the first thing is to insulate, then to produce heat with renewables, if possible, to see the building as an energy system. Uh, and if you are doing all that with good technology, some of them coming uh, from, <clears throat> from France or from other countries, you will reduce the use of energy and reduce the CO2 emissions. One problem that we, we are facing in France is that, sorry, is that, you know, France is 63 million people, uh, and we still have in France 3,500,000 3, homes with, uh, using fuel to heat the home. Uh, using fuel means importing oil, because France has ideas but no oil. 
Uh, and second thing, it means we are producing CO these homes are producing CO2 emissions. And last thing, they are not customer from EDF. Um, so it means that it would be better if we were able to shift the heating system from these homes, from a fuel system to electric system. And so we, we are working, we are working very much on heat pumps. I'm sure that here all people are knowing uh, what a heat pump is. We are working on heat pumps, on heat pumps with a, the right characteristics for the French climate. It means heat pumps who will take the heat outside in the air and bring in it in the heat system. In France, our heating system are not like here. Most of the systems for heating here are using air. In France, we are using water, water system. We have water pipes in the different rooms. And so there will be, this will be air water heat pumps. And in, at EDF R&D, we developed a new type of heat pumps with, uh, I think, nice and efficient a thermodynamic cycle, and so on and so on. And we have now industrialized this heat pump, and we had some field test results. You know probably the characteristic of a heat pump is that is seen globally through a coefficient, which is a COP, the coefficient of performance of the heat pump, uh, what is this coefficient? If you use one kilowatt of electricity, you may bring, for example, three kilowatt, uh, if you are using, sorry, uh, one kilowatt hour electricity and bringing three kilowatt hour of heat, the COP is three. Uh, when it's three, it's a good heat pump. And we have seen now that uh, we field test our, our heat pump has a COP between three and four. Uh, also, when you, you know probably from the thermodynamic point of view, from the thermodynamic, by the pr principle of thermodynamic, the COP is decreasing when the outside temperature is decreasing. That's normal. And uh, even with relatively cold weather, we had a COP which was near two, which means uh, correct performance for a hair water heat pump. And with this product, we think we will replace, we will help the citizen to replace their old fuel heater by heat pumps. Almost everywhere in the world, the heat pump technology is now well developed. There are still many, many research in this area to develop more performant heat pumps. This is coming, in some cases, from automotive industry. In the automotive industry, for the air conditioning system, you are developing heat exchangers and other things you, that you could transfer to heat pump for the home, uh, some technologies. And it's done now in Japan, in France, in Germany. And uh, the heat pump will progressively help in different countries to replace all fuel systems, all heating system, by uh, by heat pump, it means that you will replace fuel system or system using gas by electricity. It's, it's more electricity for <clears throat> to replace fossil fuel, and that is something which is happening progressively in different areas. I will go further. Our first heat pump. Uh, like the German, uh, like what our colleagues from Germany has all, also done, were made for family home. For family home, it's relatively simple. Uh, what we are trying to do now, it's for for school, sorry, it's for school, or for, I would say, little building with six or eight uh, family flats, and we are now developing new heat pumps. Uh, to replace in these buildings, in these schools, all the fuel system by heat pumps. It means replacing fuel by electricity.
sorry, I went too quickly. So, to end this first short paragraph on the heating system and more electricity in the homes, uh, I would add something. In the US, you are replacing the homes relatively quickly. It means that your building fleet uh, is changing relatively quickly. Uh, I would say the average uh, is, I would say, if I co I'm correct, is about uh, around, uh, around 30, 30 years that you are, the, your average uh, uh, life of the building. In France, in old Europe, uh, like your former president said, uh, the building fleet is changing very, very, very slowly. It means the, the average life time of a building in France is one century, is 100 years. It means that if we like to succeed to reduce by a factor of four the CO2 emissions in 2050, we have to, stay, to, to change the, the, the way we are building new homes. And I know that you are doing research here in this area, uh, like in other countries. How do we build new homes using less energy? But what's very important for us, because we are changing the homes so slowly, is to renew, to be able to insulate and to use new technology for old uh, buildings because in 2030, in 2050, a part of the buildings who are existing now will still be there. Uh, and for example, we have we made a study at EDF R&D. Uh, I show here the result. We made a study uh, on how will it well, how we will it be possible to run the building fleet of France without CO2 at that time with the best available technology on 2010, not using future technology. And it's possible. It's possible using actual insulation materials, using heat pumps, use, introducing at the home PV panels. That way it could be possible. And the result, what is interesting, it yet you will have a bit use biomass, you will have uh, locally electric renewables, and you will need, you will still need 15% more electricity, centralized electricity, and that way you won't have any more CO2 emitted by the building. I'm not speaking from the building, the homes, but I'm speaking from the running the system. Going to the transportation uh, domain. Uh, here you have a slide on explaining what will happen if you are using plug-in hybrid vehicle. Uh, here you have the CO2 content of electricity. For example, in France, with the nuclear, as I was mentioning, the CO2 content is relatively low. If you are in UK, in Italy, in uh, Germany, or in the States, you are in this area. When you are using your hybrid vehicle, 30% uh, of the kilometers that you are doing are using the electric fuel. You have enough battery to do that you see a reduction of the CO2 emissions. If half of the kilometers you are using the electricity, the reduction of CO2 emissions will be better. And if you have a purely electric vehicle, it's evidently far better. You could ask me, but why with an electric vehicle here, it will be worse than using direct directly uh, fuel. The reason is very simple. If you are here, it means that you are producing your electricity using coal. And if you are using coal to produce electricity, you are emitting much CO2 when you produce the electricity. And globally, 
the balance is not good. Anyway, we have not so many areas in the world where the electricity is so bad. And so it means that almost everywhere it will be better from the CO2 emissions point of view and from the use of fossil fuel to use PHEV or EV uh, to replace the actual cars. So it's evident, evident that's clear that's for, for us as a utility that's interesting, but from global interest of mankind, it will be a clear progress. After that, you have to discuss with type of vehicle, with tap, how do you are charging him, and so on and so on. That is uh, another discussion that we, we could have a bit later. Moving to the industry. In the industry, 70% of the energy that you are using is for heating, for heat, to produce heat. In many cases, you are still using coal directly or coke, like in the um, steel industry and so on. We are developing at EDF R&D with many partners a new process uh, to help the industrial company to shift their process from coal or other bad things to electricity. Uh, the first thing is clearly, as usual, energy efficiency. But then I will mention two, two things. One is developing the induction heating. You have that perhaps in your kitchen uh, using to, to cook. Uh, you have an induction system. Uh, we are convinced that induction is a way to use uh, very well electricity, very efficient way to use electricity to heat tubes and different uh, pieces that you, uh, you, you may use in your industry. Uh, you see here, uh, at least foundries, mechanical industry, uh, heat treatment, food also, even to produce ice, uh, Eskimo, that you, you may use induction. Uh, a second way or third way to develop use of electricity in industry is heat pump. Uh, heat pump, I don't say it's a magical thing, but you may specially develop uh, big heat pumps who are using, I would say, the lost heat in industry. Very often in the industrial processes, and the end of the process, you have perhaps water uh, at a temperature of 40 degrees uh, or 60 degrees, and you could use it. Uh, if you are increasing slightly the temperature of this water, you could reuse this water to do something. Uh, so with special specialized heat pump, you, you may do that very easily. And the global balance for energy is very good, very, very good. So I went very quickly on the demand side through my three points at home, on the road, in the industry. I will go now to the smart electrical system. I'm using the, the word smart because everybody now is speaking from smart grid, smart meter, smart citizen, and so on and so on. Uh, but I will perhaps show that it's not so evident to be smart. Uh, first, I will be, we will be uh, at home, or not far from our home, with a smart meter. Then we move to the grid. And I will finish with the electrical system in the whole. Uh, globally, uh, it will be my last point. That is for Art Rosenfeld and for all for you. Uh, we have made energy efficiency in, uh, in France before, I would say, the majority of you were born. Uh, you see here, 1955, uh, my predecessors deployed, decided to use PLC uh, power line currents at the musical frequency is uh, 175 and 188 hertz to send a, a signal to the homes of the customers to 
put on or put off the water heater in the home. In the home. We have now 11 million water heaters running only in the night, automatically. The signal is sent at 10 in the evening, after the peak load of the evening, and the heating is stopped when the water is at the right temperature before 6 in the morning. And this system is using the electricity in the night. As, as you know, in the night, uh, we have less use of electricity globally because the people are sleeping, the industrial system are not running, most of them are not running. And so you use the base load, which is a good load, it means hydro and nuclear. Uh, so it was a system to shift the load to avoid a peak load, which is very old, before all the IT system that we are able to develop now uh, and this system is still running. And I could say, especially for you, Joe, it would be impossible now to install such a system uh, because the new regulations that we have, splitting the system uh, in regulated part and deregulated part, it would be impossible to install such a system now. Because, as you see, we are using the, the network, which is a regulated business, and we are selling electricity, which is a deregulated business. And to pull all that together, it would probably need mm, so many years that it would be impossible. It would be far longer than to develop a new nuclear plant in the US. So, uh, a few slides on the smart meter project that we have. We will replace progressively all the meters in the homes by uh, electronic meters who, are able, who have far more functionalities. Uh, and it's not, not what we are doing now, it's a pilot project uh, with only 300,000 meters, which are all already almost all installed in two areas from France uh, with two different characteristics. And we are looking how the system is uh, running because you have many, many things in such a system. Sorry. Ah. Voila. Uh, in such a system, for people who are not specialists, you are coming from the home. When you are saying it's in the home, that's not so evident. 50% of the meters are outside the home or the flat. So it means that if you say the meter is installed such a way that the citizen uh, may look on the use of electricity, you have to put another thing in the home. Uh, then you have to transmit the information to a concentrator. It's uh, not far from the last transformer. Then you have to send the information to some IT system, the IT system from the grid operator, but also the IT system from the, from the vendor of electricity, and so on and so on. So we are trying to, we are experimenting this system, and uh, it will normally be developed, uh, deployed everywhere uh, up to 2013, after the result of the pilot project. I will show you, uh, I will try to show you shortly that uh, all that could seem marvelous, but the evil is in the details. If you are changing slightly the architecture, you, you will change many things, you will change the business models. Here I show you a marvelous home, only biomass and electricity. All the systems, uh, the white products and so on, are connected to the Wi-Fi system in the home to an energy box. First case. First case, the energy box is through internet directly connected to uh, the electricity provider. 
and this uh, electricity provider or local aggregator of uh, use of electricity may decide to stop the heating system. You have a commercial contract. He may stop the electric, the electric, system, electric heating system for a few minutes if there is a peak load or different things. And the consequence of that is that the grid operator doesn't know necessarily what will happen on his network. If, instead to do that, the communication is going through the network operator, the network operator will know what he needs to know on what is happening on his network, and the local aggregator will have that through the network operator. So if you are changing slightly the architecture, you will change many, many things. And so the, the point is that we, have, we are now facing in France a big debate on the detailed architecture that we have to implement. And uh, I see that in many countries, the people are speaking from deploying, the, deplo uh, deploying smart meters. But the question is, which is uh, what is the objective? How will it be done? It's not so simple. I will go through that, because that is a sociology analysis of the customers that it's uh, very important. But uh, I look, I see that we don't have so much time. Uh, I will go to the smart grid. Smart grid, that's, the question is, is the following. It's very simple. Uh, if you have a feeder, the last the line, going from the last transformer to the different homes. Here are the homes. You have different homes on the electric line uh, behind the last transformer. In every country, that is a black box for the grid operator. But he is knowing that he has to maintain the tension for all homes between a minimum and a maximum. If it's the case, all the citizen customers are satisfied. The quality of the electricity is good enough. And uh, it's a quiet system. If you are introducing here or here or here some PV panels, this decrease will change. You may have over uh, a voltage, a tension, which is too high. And so all that, all the system is changing. For this reason, you need more sensors on the system, you need to introduce intelligence on the network, on the grid, such a way that the grid operator may run the system correctly. Perhaps you, you had some comments on that by Yakut Mansour a few months ago. The, the introduction of distributed generation has many consequences. The consequence of the distribution networks that I was mentioning and consequence globally of the electrical system because uh, if you have PV, installed PV panels as cheap as possible, it means that the grid operator has no information on the generation of electricity by the PV panels. It, it changes fundamentally the situation that the utilities, the grid operators had for the last century. Up to now, if you have only centralized generation, you are knowing what uh, the plants are producing. You have 100, 200, 300 plants. You are knowing what's happening. When you have thousands and thousands from PV panels, the observability of the system is decreasing, and the commandability of the system is decreasing. If it's the quantity of these PV panels is low, it's not a real problem. But you know that the quantity, the number of uh, PV panels of wind, uh, wind uh, mills is increasing everywhere. Uh, and the consequence of that is that to integrate them correctly on the system, that it's possible, but it has a cost, you have to give the network operator at the different level the possibility to observe the system, to know the state of the real state of the system. And that's a real issue. That it's a political debate. 
everywhere, I think, in the world. It's a, it's a case here in the US, in Europe. Do you impose to the producer from wind energy and uh, solar energy to invest in the what uh, gives the possibility to the dispatchers to have uh, to know what's happening on their network? We are doing, like in every country, some demonstration projects, some experimentation in this area. Uh, we will try to, to insert also in the next years the, the EV and the PHEV such a way that with controlling the moment when they will, will charge their cars, we will have the possibility to, sh to, sh to shave the peak load. My last point, and I will stop. In France, in every country, you have a, an electricity mixed between different resources, coal, gas, nuclear, hydro, and so on. In France, that it's a typical week in winter, uh, you have the nuclear here, you have the hydro, you have the coal plant, and you have the gas turbine for the peak load. You see that nuclear is following partially the load. Then you, you add the different possibility depending from the cost and from the CO2 emissions. When you are introducing much wind energy or solar energy, uh, here, what I was, what is here relatively clear is the generation by 30% of wind power on our system. If we had 30% of renewables in uh, France, uh, we could have this load curve. You have the 52 weeks. You have some days, some week with more wind and solar, some other with less. The consequence of that is that you have to maintain all the old system, the centralized generation. For example, this week, you see that you have almost no generation produced by wind energy and solar energy. Uh, it was happening in Germany uh, last year, the 30th of June. The generation by wind decreased from 9,000 megawatt to 100 megawatt in one hour. And then uh, they have this situation for a few hours. So that is one point. You have to maintain the old centralized plan. Second point, if you are trying to re-optimize the system, as you have seen in France, we have electricity with very low CO2, CO2 with hydro and nuclear. If we say with wind energy, you will replace nuclear by wind energy, that is a solution, expensive solution, but it's a possibility. You will increase the CO2 emission because the day where you don't have wind, you will have to use the coal plant or the gas plant. So what I want to say is that we are pushing all, we are pushing the renewables, but the renewables are not an absolutely zero CO2 solution. Uh, that it's clear. Each mean of electricity generation have a CO2 content. Uh, because you have to produce the wind, the wind uh, windmills and the solar panels. But after that, due to systemic effect, uh, you could have more emission if you are inserting too much renewables in such system. Storage, it, that it's a big, big, big issue for the century. If we are able to produce, to store electricity, we will change at the correct cost. We will change totally the situation. Here, that's the story of the compressed air storage. You put, you, you compress electricity in a hole when you have uh, not too much load and we use it, you use it after that to produce electricity. Uh, you have here a demonstration that we are doing using a sodium sulfur battery in La Réunion, it's a Japanese battery. Here is also in Japan 
houses with PV panels and batteries. So we've seen in the world many researchers in the storage area, many demonstration projects, but I would say to summarize, the sentence, be green, stay cheap, is impossible to realize now. Uh, we are waiting for all the results of Berkeley. And last point is that the energy world is not exactly like this slide uh, with such a very uh, quiet orchestra. We are facing, we have needs in the research area, we have needs in the regulations area. Uh, my first conclusion is that we need clever, smart, stable regulations because the actual regulations in many countries are partially contradictory. It means that we need people like you are doing uh, here, uh, people who are doing research on the global system and not only on each technology. And then we need smart politicians able to implement these regulations. And my second conclusion was my title. Uh, we, I'm convinced, we are convinced at EDF that with more electricity, we will provide more uh, happiness to, to all mankind using nuclear, I'm voluntary provocative, and renewable energy. Thank you. So we're going to uh, take some questions, but first I want to thank you for his time with us today and present you with a, uh, <laughs> thank you. a nice uh, poster of the uh, material we, he presented for you today. Thank you. It will be nice in my office. Yeah, good. So um, I don't think we need a microphone. I, we have some here, but I think if you speak up, please state your name uh, and maybe a little bit about what group you're with at LBL so he has some idea about uh, your domain knowledge. Go ahead and take questions. Okay. Yeah, it's a big recording. Oh, do we need to use microphones? Yeah. Okay. There also won't be on the tape. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. We've got the mics on. Is that working? Yep. Okay. Questions? You skipped over a lot of material in the middle where you were talking about behavior and social factors. And I see in your last slide a picture of the European label. And I was just interested in what your experience has been and how successful the label has been in conveying information to people about their energy use, both in industry, commercial, or residential, if you have that information. Which information precisely? On the, on the energy label, telling you how much energy the building is using or the appliance is using. Do you look and see whether providing information, look at the, the European label there yes. in the upper left. Do those labels work in your, in your view? What do they tell people and how do they change their behavior when they have those labels? Okay, I will try to answer. First of all, we, to, be, to, to, give a, to try to give a precise answer. First of all, what we see it's always better if the people has to change their behavior not having to watch on the electricity or the energy consumption every day because it's boring. There's other more exciting thing to do, uh, a football match or something like that. Uh, and what is good if that the technology is using them to decide once a year or twice a year or when they install the new system, uh, that's the good way. I give you two examples. The first one, when you are going in your car, the air conditioning system is running automatically, even if the outside temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. It would be far better if the car asks you every time, do I need uh, do you need the air conditioning system? That's first answer. Second answer, when you install a new heating system, you may allow a certain margin between the lowest temperature that you are allowing the highest. Uh, there was an experimentation, if I remember, here in, uh, around Los Angeles by, uh, by uh, Continental Edison, uh, that they cut uh, with a thermostat uh, they cut the heating system, uh, and when the temperature 
when the, they have a peak load in the area and the, the system was running again automatically when the temperature increased by four degrees. Uh, art is, I don't know if I'm correct, but it's something like that, if I remember. If you are using such a system, you don't have to, to look at it. You decide that you allow that. Uh, so what we have seen is two things. The young generation are changing slightly, are slightly different from what we are or how we are. But changing the, the, post, the, the, the way the people are acting is very slow. Uh, far slower than to change the technology. Second thing, what we have done in France, we had to reduce the use of electricity from 30 terawatt hours accumulated. It means that we had a plan to reduce the use of electricity in France for our residential uh, and industrial customers. The most difficult thing uh, was not uh, in the area of in the, to discuss with the citizen. The most difficult thing was to qualify more the, the people who are refurbishing the homes or the profession, the professional, uh, that they have the tools and the ability to insulate the home correctly at the low cost. That was the most difficult thing. We, we have educate with the Federation for building, uh, Buildings for Building in France, we educate uh, around 10,000 professionals to be better and less expensive to refurbishing homes. Do I answer your question? Yes. Partially. Other questions? This is more of a comment than a question. It seems like a, a cornerstone of your plan for buildings is to replace fuels producing heat with electricity and heat pumps. But in, in most of the world where we produce electricity using fossil fuels, it seems like that strategy doesn't really lead you to, to CO2 reductions or not very large ones. Could you precise? Um, I'm, I'm saying if... if your strategy of using um, electricity and heat pumps to displace fuel burning in homes mm -hmm. to reduce CO2 works when you produce the electricity with very low CO2. But, mm -hmm. but if you're using fossil fuels to produce the CO2 and you have all the losses in the system, it seems like that strategy does not give you CO2 emissions reductions. It, first of all, it's, you are absolutely right. If the CO2 content of your electricity is, is bad, is very high, uh, you don't have an advantage for this strategy. It's clear. But if you are thinking that progressively the CO2 content of electricity is better, this strategy is the right one. Uh, and what we are thinking is that not everywhere but in many countries, progressively, the, the utilities will be pushed by the government to decrease the CO2 content of the electricity. They have to reduce the CO2 emissions. It's far easier to ask to a utility to decrease the CO2 content of this, of this electricity than to ask directly people to avoid to use, um, to use biomass or to use uh, wood to, for heating. It's always easier because they have less actors, less companies to act that. And what we see that in many countries, in Europe, in Japan, and in other countries now, the utilities are asked to implement more renewables. It means globally to reduce the CO2 content. But you, I agree, in some area uh, from the US or from, the ch from China, the content the CO2 content of electricity is very high, and this strategy is not the right one. But uh, the strategy I was showing is actually the right one in many countries, and my point of view is that it, it will be the right one every 10 years in more countries. Other questions? <clears throat> 
one of the problem is the fact that when it's uh, uh, you need electricity in the morning in France, uh, you should provide electricity between seven to eight hour, eight a.m. And after that, you don't need to provide any electricity more or less during the day and at seven p.m. Why do, don't you try to organize the electricity in Europe until um, until Moscow? Because when it's day in Moscow, it's night in France, and you can use the electricity mm. provided by one and given by the other, and do some exchange like that. And for example, in Norway, Norway, you can use uh, uh, water to, uh, to provide uh, yes. electricity another time. When it's heat in some part of Europe, it's cold in other parts. So, uh, some global... Yes, but that it's, uh, I would say, that it's a Interesting point, and also a dream. Why? Uh, it's because up to now, when you are transporting electricity very far from where you are producing electricity, due to home slow, uh, you have losses. I would say 5% for 1,000 kilometers or something like that, grosso modo. Uh, it means that to use electricity too far from where you are producing it, uh, it's now, with the actual uh, state of the technology, difficult. Perhaps uh, in 50, year, 50 years from now, if we have superconducting materials uh, with less losses, it will be uh, interesting to do that. What, personally, I think is that um, even with at the scale of Europe, of, of US or China, you have slightly, diff slightly difference of the time where the peak load are occurring. But uh, the best way, probably, to shave the peak load is first of all uh, to, to, to shave the peak load is first of all to try to shift the load from one moment to another. If you have one heat pump with the water tank, uh, you may shift partially uh, the peak. If you are um, recharging your cars when the load is low, you are also uh, pushing the, the load curve to be very regular and so on. I think there are more simple way to do, to realize what you are suggesting without transporting electricity very far. Perhaps it will be there uh, when the youngest people who are in this home will retire. Okay, let's take one more. Any other last questions? Oh, one, one more in the back. It's the last one. Thank you very much for your talk. I, I'm curious about this triangle at the end. Uh, you have renewable, nuclear, and then energy efficiency. Uh, what do you imagine is the role for EDF, or the utility, in providing the energy efficiency part of this triangle. C clearly, you've suggested that the utility should be responsible for nuclear energy and renewable, but what, what role should the utility itself take in providing the energy efficiency side? Okay. Uh, your question, perhaps, I, I, I will formulate, uh, uh, if you allow, is it seems to be strange that a utility who, has to, who, who is selling, which is selling electricity, uh, try to reduce what the needs of the customers is perhaps what you have uh, in your mind. Uh, my answer is very clear. The, the, the mission originally, historically, uh, EDF was created after World War II. We didn't have enough electricity in France. At that time, the role of the utility was to provide the right quantity as of electricity to the need of the economy and the citizens. Uh, it's a reason why uh, I was showing the system from 1955 with the, uh, tele with the PLC system, the water heating system running the night. That it's typically a way uh, EDF uh, was running, was doing his business uh, providing enough electricity uh, during the 24 hours a, a day, every day, uh, using also system to shave the peak load. I think that 
uh, with the smart regulations I was asking for, uh, you may push or actually now the politicians in very in different countries are pushing the utilities to develop energy efficiency. Uh, I will give you one example, uh, which is not virtue like the example that I gave first, another example, which is coming directly from the regulation. We, we are selling every year around 500 terawatt hours electricity. The government decided that we have to reduce on the actual perimeter, which is very difficult to define, but on the perimeter of our customers, we had to reduce the amount of electricity for the next three years of 30 terawatt hours QMAC. What it means? It means that if you are changing a fridge B by a fridge A, for the lifetime of the fridge, say 12 years, there will be a reduction of use of electricity. So we have to provide that to, to push that. If we are not succeeding to do that, we will have a penalty. And, um, and so uh, the question was, is it better to pay something to the state or to make the reduction? Uh, it's, for us, it was evident that to be the, I would say, a business, uh, company who is running in the public interest, we had to do the first solution and to, to succeed to make this reduction. And the question, the difficulty that we were facing was not to succeed. We, we succeed to do that. Uh, we educate many, many professionals. I was mentioning that and, and so on and so on. The success was too, too high because after that, we succeed to, to do more than 30 terawatt hours. And now for the second period, the government asks us to do far more. <laughs> and I know that here you have other systems with the decoupling of the tariffs of the energy that you are selling, that it was invented here, if I know. So you, you may invent very smart regulation to help the utilities to do their business correctly and to push energy efficiency. Well, thank you so much. That was a, a great answer. And it's a, it's a continuing story for our future to get this, this uh, pyramid correct here. I, I want to thank everybody for coming and thank our speaker again for Thank you.